uh, counter arguments, for lack of a better word, where they're saying, you know, oh, we're being told this. And then you have uh, like Cheadle and others saying, no, no, that's not true. But it's like, y- y- wait a minute. Somebody just testified for an hour that it is true. What uh, are you shocked at some of the inconsistencies? And from your perspective, does it seem like they're being somewhat evasive in giving the American people answers? It, they are completely, and it's by design. I think it, it all goes down to the fact that it's the wrong person in the room answering those questions. You take someone like a Cheadle or a Christopher Ray from the FBI. Christopher Ray has publicly said that he has oversight of the FBI. He's sort of insulated and bubble wrapped from what's going on. I'd be far more interested in hearing from the deputy director, Paula Bate, who kind of has his hand on the pulse and knows what's going on in those investigations. But those guys are rarely called in front of Congress. So that's sort of a hack around accountability because they can put up these directors who don't really know and and they're doing their best, maybe intentionally obfuscating, being vague, but then they also have plausible deniability, which is a problem. The the congressional representatives that have these guys at in front of them need to be drilling down. They need to have people in the ear like me or other guys to kind of know the exact terminology to pin these guys down on so they can't parry away from it because it's all too often that you, they will answer the question with a non-answer and it's incredibly frustrating. And, and then I think also the other problem is just the mindset of the interrogators in the process. The far the vast majority of those senators and Congress people that are interrogating them, they're like system guys. They they just want the system to operate and they view having a hearing itself as success. Whereas you and me and the American people see success as an outcome, an outcome being the answers that we need. And there's a big disconnect between the people and our representation. I agree. There's a big difference because we don't want just a hearing We want an actual outcome that is the right outcome. Welcome back, Warriors. This is me, Linda B. Thank you all so much for joining me here today. Today, I've got some an FBI whistleblower. His name is Steve Friend. He is, like I said, an FBI whistleblower and an author of True Blue. He's talking with fellow YouTube content creator Stephen Gardner about what really is going on with the FBI and how they have been less than truthful. You are going to want to stick around to the very end. Don't forget to like, comment, share, subscribe if you haven't already, and hit that notification bell. Watch the video to the end. Now, let's get back into it. Do you do you think these members of Congress don't know who the right people are to bring in? Or do you think it's just uh, tradition to bring in the head of the organization? I think it's probably both. I think that, that that's just their default answer. Again, system guys, we want to find out what's going on at the Secret Service. Let's get the director of the Secret Service. But these are enormous bureaucracies. I can tell you that the FBI is roughly 38 to 39,000 employees, 56 field offices. It's a pyramid structure. So Christopher Ray or his deputies, they're surrounded by a small cadre of people inside the Hoover building at the seventh floor. I mean, I was working in rural Iowa with three people in an office in a bank building and going out on an Indian reservation. My experience in the FBI is vastly different than the FBI director. So Knowing what's going on, getting the pulse of what the actual agents are doing with their actual investigative work is not going to be something that these guys are are going to be able to answer or even willing to because they don't fear accountability at this point. They haven't been called to the carpet. Even though Cheadle resigned, that's a personal decision. She's not going to face any criminal charges or anything of the like. And Chris Ferre continues to see the FBI get an enhanced budget every time he goes up there in an obvious case and refuses to answer questions. Yeah. One thing that I noticed with Cheadle and the, the other gentleman, I just forgot his name. It'll come. It'll come to me. Um, but uh, whether it's Senator Ted Cruz or Josh Hawley or, or somebody saying, you know, who is the person or has that if you don't want to give up a name, has that person been fired or removed from duty or and, and they refuse to say it's a person but it's always like, well, no, it's a pro. You don't understand. This is a process. This is a procedure. And and it's like they refuse to say that there's anybody that makes decisions or does the planning for the Secret Service. To me, is is that like an um, umbrella of protection? I I get like, hey, at this point, we don't want to release a name because that person could be 
you know, have their life put in danger. But like, yes, that person has been fired or or set to the side until the investigation. But none of that's happening. They just keep blaming it on a process. And there's supposed to be some sort of internal investigation about conduct of what went on. That would be reasonable. I think that's sort of the process they're talking about. But they haven't been put on any sort of restricted duty. They've been temporarily assigned elsewhere. They're not not collecting a paycheck, which is utterly shocking at this point when you consider the fact that some of the guys that I've become acquainted with and friendly with in the last couple of years have been accused wrongfully and provably wrongfully of doing things that they didn't do. And then the FBI immediately put them on the shelf, indefinitely suspended them without pay. And for a guy like Marcus Allen, 27 months, a guy like Garrett O'Boyle, 22 months. And it's been adjudicated that those guys didn't do anything wrong. So I think really, even though there might've been a massive screw up in the eyes of these federal agencies, the worst thing you can do is embarrass the agency by its own conduct. And that's why I'm a little bit surprised that they haven't actually gotten a scalp on the wall just to get the heat off. But at the same time, if they have a good German under there willing to just follow orders at the same time, I think that they're just going to take care of. Them. OK, um, from an FBI perspective, help me and my audience understand what what kind of uh, measures or, or tactics or procedures might the FBI be doing right now? I, I would assume they go out and investigate. They go to the crime scene. They start collecting, trying to get an account from many different perspectives. What What is that investigation like? It's going to be incredibly involved. It's going to have a lot of moving pieces in it. You would do uh, a, a canvas. You would try to talk, get witness statements. You would, I think, believe they're going to get a actual voluntary interview with former President Trump, which is shocking that he would actually participate in that, not just have it be in writing to his attorneys. They would want to get a ballistics calculation and, and and adjudicate where each round was, assemble a timeline, which is what you saw the senators sort of talking to the U.S. Secret Service about the sequence of events to recognize where maybe the security failures were. Because this investigation is, is your bad guy is known. It's not a whodunit at this point. It's not trying to assign guilt or anything. They're just trying to collect the pieces and figure out how he was able to penetrate because that would be useful information going forward. They should probably look into the communications that went on there, any sort of recordings of the radio transmissions, of the text messages that were going on between all the police and the Secret Service, any sort of security personnel. Even if they were using government phones, what were they doing during the timeline? Were they maybe scrolling their Facebook account when they should have had eyes on on the, on, the, on the crowd. All those sorts of things need to go on. Tons of interviews need to be conducted in order to assemble this. And here's the most worrying thing to me about this. Uh, during the Senate hearing, Deputy Director Paula Bate told Ron Johnson from Wisconsin that the FBI is going to investigate this as an assassination as well as potential domestic terrorism. Now, to the layperson, you think, okay, let's just look at all potential options. That seems reasonable to me. But for people who want transparency, if the FBI investigates this as terrorism, they're going to be able to slap a classified label on it. And they're not going to be transparent with the American people about what they find. Oh, interesting. Oh, gosh. So <laughs> the fact that they're not being transparent with the American people is not shocking to me at all because they are never really transparent. And the thing about it is they are not talking to the right people. They need to not talk to the director like a Christopher Ray. And Kim Cheadle has already resigned. She chose to do that, which was a good thing to do. And nothing's going to happen to her. And Christopher Ray is not close enough to, and Christopher Ray is the director um, of the FBI. He is not close enough to what is actually going on to really, really know. And so far, all we keep getting from, no matter who is put up in front of Congress, all we get is, I have, it's an ongoing investigation. I don't have that information yet in front of me. And all they do is just keep delaying and delaying and pushing it off. And what happens after that? Do they come back, give them a date by which they have to have the required information? You must have this information. They should be required to have it the first hearing. And if you don't, don't have it, we're going to assume that you're guilty and punishment will be handed out. That's, you know, that's just in Linda B's world, okay? I know that's not the actual world, but that's how, in my opinion, it should be done. Something, these people need to be held accountable and not just pushing it off by saying it's an ongoing investigation and I don't have that information in front of me. Ridiculous. And now the fact that they can, it can be like considered an um, terrorist thing that they don't have to be transparent. 
crazy. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Like uh, you mentioned earlier, it's like they, they want to get to the truth, but they also don't want to embarrass the agency. And so there's, there's, there's this conflict um, going, going on there. Why, um, why would they want Donald Trump to testify just that, yes, I went there. Yes. I gave a speech. Yes. I got shot in the ear. Um, you know, Christopher Ray tried to cast doubt on whether I was shot, even though it was on live national television. Why, why have him come in and testify? I guess I don't understand that. I think it'd probably be as a procedure you want to attempt to have contact with the victim of the crime. He, Donald Trump okay. being one of the victims of this assassination, he is the only victim, but there were other people who were injured and one did perish. So it's a procedural thing. And that's why I've said that he shouldn't go and talk to them. There really is no upside. If they want to send a list of questions through his attorneys, he can respond to them. But you're really only setting yourself up for sort of like a Mike Flynn trap, particularly when you're talking to the FBI, who has proven itself to be politically partisan, and they've gone after him on multiple occasions and meddled in the last two presidential elections against him. Yeah. God, wouldn't that be something if he, he, he says something and they twist it and they're like, oh, you know, you're now we're trying to get a paper trail, kind of like with uh, January 6th, right? Everyone kept saying, oh, Trump's been having these secret communications with these white supremacy groups or or the Proud Boys or whatever. And like, they're, they're just never found any communication trail um, linking him to these groups. And yet there was this attempt um, to do that. Um, switching gears just for a second, uh, you know, within the last week, there was large gatherings in Washington, D.C. of people that were protesting for uh, Palestine. Uh, they were doing, you know, graffiti, damage, um, vandalism, uh, burning flags, taking down American flags, hoisting Palestinian flags, uh, beating up police officers. And yet all of these people had their charges dropped very, very quickly. Why is that so different? than what happened on January 6th, where most of the people were nonviolent, uh, came into the Capitol, and yet they're being treated as if they're domestic terrorism uh, terrorists. And these other people, I'm not saying they are, but they, they obviously crossed a line when it comes to peaceful protest. Why the different treatment of the two, the two groups? Because we exist in a post-fair process, a post-system of justice that's equal for all, where Lady Justice is blindfolded at this point. You have a weaponized government who is picking winners and losers. And look, those charges that were dropped a week ago were for the lower court in Washington, D.C. It's a federal district, so all cases are federal, but they sort of have a difference between uh, the local crime that does occur and the in the federal crimes that we that we generally understand it to be they were dropped at a local level they weren't even considered at a higher level whereas the january 6 cases have all been adjudicated at the highest level of federal court and they have just continued to weaponize the process even despite the supreme court ruling about the fisher decision where the obstruction of an official proceeding was deemed to be wholly inappropriate of a charge that's an evidence tampering tax law and now the department of justice is going to bring a new charge a 231 civil disorder, another felony charge, and they'll issue superseding indictments against those people and allow the FBI to claim additional indictments, even though those people have already been indicted. So they'll be able to get extra quota points, and then they'll get be able to get extra arrest statistics to support a narrative that they have been propping up over the last six to eight years about this rise in domestic terrorism that they can assign to anyone who is right of center. And the last thing I'll say is, this is so broad at this point that the FBI has a new term that they call anti-government, anti-authority, violent extremism, the acronym being AGAVE, A-G-A-A-V-E. And the FBI itself, publicly information, available information, defines AGAVE as someone who just has a perception of government overreach or negligence. Meet that profile and you could be in the crosshairs of a domestic terrorist investigation. Yeah, so basically anyone that's right of center, anyone conservative, particularly MAGA, Republican, Donald Trump supporter, you know, what happened on that fateful day in 2021, the first month of the year, they were people who were there who were protesting peacefully, but they were led into the building. They didn't break in, they were led in. And that's something that is it has come up, but the propaganda media does not want people to know the truth. People are getting surface level. 
And I say, and I'll say it again, the media needs to be held accountable for what they're doing. They're like the great instigator, causing people to get all up in their feelings and to demonize half of the American public. I mean, we've got two different groups of people and it has nothing to do with anything other than ideology. Those that are free thinking, that don't believe the propaganda media, and those who are essentially indoctrinated, brainwashed, who go along with the propaganda media, and those are the ones, the ones that go along with the propaganda are the ones that absolutely hate Donald Trump. You know, I got some people in my family and friends who consider themselves Christian. They don't want to use the word hate, but really it is teetering on hate. Because even after the attempted assassination, there was no, I pray for his family. I don't like him, but I don't want anybody to be hurt. It was more like he brought this on himself. He deserves it. You know, (laughs) we're being indoctrinated. You keep watching TV and the propaganda news, you're turning to something that you don't even recognize. And it is a two-tier justice system. Anyone that is right of center gets treated differently than someone who is left of center. Jeez Louise, that's me. <laughs> I, I'm not uh, the 56 men signed a declaration, I think, that puts them squarely in the scope. Yeah, wow. Uh, yeah, I'm very distrustful of uh, just about everything related to the government. Um, let's see. Oh, what was I going to ask you? Um, oh, um, you you brought up on my show the last time you were on that the January 6th thing very quickly became uh, viewed by people within the FBI as a career maker, a way to really beef up your um, resume, your curriculum vitae, whatever you want to call it. Do you think with situations like uh, this this Palestinian um, uh, protest where there was, you know, burning of the flag and an attack on police, do you think some of it has to do with um, I, I can't really get ahead with my career. It's not really worth pursuing. But this J6 story is so big and there's so many big names like Pelosi and Schumer and, and other members of Congress that, that it, it kind of took on a life of its own compared to some of these other situations. Yes. And the other thing to remember is that just the size and scope that they're able to expand it out to. So you have the the Palestinian support protest going on comparatively to the size of the, just the number of people voluminously who were there on January 6th. It looks far smaller and you're not able to spread it out the way that they manipulated the case management as they did with January 6th. So if you did everything by the book, January 6th should be run from Washington, D.C. as one case and however many subjects you're going to investigate under that one case. But the FBI departed from their rules. And because there were so many people there, they said, we're going to open a separate case for every single person. And as opposed to having them be officially in Washington, D.C., we'll open it wherever they live. So if you live in Denver, now it's a domestic terrorist case in Denver. And that has allowed them to create the illusion to get the narrative going about domestic terrorism. It's also allowed them to bring in more co-conspirators, for lack of a better term, because senior executives in all of the 56 field offices are tied down to their quotas that they have to meet, and their compensation is tied to meeting the quota. So 56 special agents in charge are getting bonuses. They're incentivized to drive their subordinates forward on these cases to open cases, get arrests, use the tools. As you, If you get a lot of people in those positions who are ambitious, and if you're a senior executive service person in the FBI, you're very ambitious to climb the ladder, you're going to get a lot more buy-in from them on that sort of case. Okay. Why do you think um, Christopher Ray was uh, acting genuinely when he said, we don't know whether Trump was really shot in the ear, or do you think that that was a subtle way of lowering the temperature of the story, um, the heroicness of Trump surviving, um, the the empathy towards the former president, um, discrediting that, you know, he, he was, had bodily harm from an assassinator. What, what are your, I, I can't understand why he would say that. Well, he's certainly proven himself to be politically partisan and uh, also someone who's not unwilling to lie to Congress, as he's done on abundant (laughs) occasions. 
But I think it also goes back to the fact that he is bubble wrapped and insulated. He doesn't have his hands on the case files. He's not really reviewing evidence. He is in charge of the FBI, but he's not really involved with the day-to-day work of the FBI. He's very much a figurehead. He's a DOJ attorney who can go there and have his nice hair and he bob and weave. He's a high enough IQ guy to have the, the, resp- the communication with the senators and the congressmen as is deemed fit in order to get and secure funding for them. But as far as actual cases go, he's not really involved. At, I mean, as, as much as it pains me to say, I'm inclined to believe that he just didn't, genuinely didn't know and then defaulted to what he always does. And that is obfuscate, never really give a direct answer because you don't want to be tied down to saying things. Well, they can then come back on you and say, well, you misrepresented those facts. And he did actually come back later and correct the record, but there was already the talking point, which I think is probably, uh, probably you could assign some nefarious nature to it as well, because it'll just be taken out of context. Christopher Wright, director of the FBI, has been known for telling things that are not quite true. And that's what he does. And as you see from Steve Friend here, is he's saying that Christopher Wright doesn't have his hands on the files. He's not close enough to the actual work. He's sort of like bubble wrapped. But because he's the director, he's more of a figurehead, but doesn't really know the ins and outs of everything, even though he's over the FBI. So really, Congress is not even talking to the right person. We need answers. We don't need a bob and weave of the facts. And clearly, he's been known for lying. He does not tell the truth. And we already know if we got two brain cells, (laughs) okay, that this was something that was orchestrated. Historically, these sorts of things, assassinations and assassination attempts, are not the work of one lone doofus type person. No offense to, well, anyway, Thomas Crooks, you know, someone loves him. Okay. And your Leah Harvey Oswalds of the world, they are just the fall guy to make it look like that's the person, but it is someone else. Okay. It is always someone else. It is the evil powers that be. We all know that. We all know that there was gross negligence. It looked intentional when you have people on the ground saying, look, there's this guy and he's got a gun. Look. And they knew about him beforehand. I did a video. They knew about him before the day of the event. And he's got overseas accounts, bank accounts. Three of them, Thomas Crooks did. So, you know, this is looking very stinky and you cannot tell me our government is not. Mm, They're not really being honest with the American people. That's just like it is. You're going to see, I'm going to put the full link to this in the description so that you can watch it and get all of it. But I just wanted you to see what's really going on. And I wanted to follow this for you all, like I said that I would. So please look at the link in the description that has the full video. Well, you all, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, share, subscribe, hit that notification bell. On my way to 50,000 subscribers, I really appreciate it. Don't forget to visit childlightcandles.com and also C60 EVO. The links are in the description and please input the discount codes. Child Light Candles is a Christian veteran-owned company that make candles and they give their profits, a lot of their profits to veterans and their families. And C60 EVO is is health and wellness, products that make you have more vitality and help you to look younger. And put the discount code and see the links in the description for more information. You all be blessed. Love God, your families, these United States of America. And as they always say, march on, warriors. (music) 